Good morning. Today is April the 7th, 2024, and this month, what, what it, this month I've been coming here 14 years, and uh, I'm very honored to have carried forth this ministry that um, Mary Jo and, and Johnny and, and Peggy and, and, and Dick, that they started at their house, so they kept that going for, I don't know, but it's been in existence now, probably close to 60 years, is it, you think about that? About 60 years, which is, you know, and I, I'm honored to be a part of that. So I, that's, because uh, when I met Johnny and Mary Jo, I just, you know, they, they, they were graceful people and they just liked me. And uh, that doesn't happen very often with me. <laughs> or it didn't, let's put it that way. Um, let's have, have a word for it. Dear Lord, thank you for this great group of people and the people that we have coming here they're friends, they're more than family, they're better than family sometimes, and I just thank you for that and their interest in your word, rightly divided. Amen. Um, announcements. Remember Pastor Richard Church of Grace Beyond Borders International? Um, he sent, he thanks everybody for their offerings given a few weeks ago when he and Pastor Indino were here. Please pray for Richard and his wife, Brooke, as they minister in Laos, Thailand, in the Philippines this next month. And let me see here. If you would, I just want to just go to um, see here. Remember what Sam was saying, he was in Colossians, and he's, he, he's, he's in chapter 2, verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us and took us out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Why do you think we study prophecy? The better you know about, the more you know about Israel, the more understanding you will have, and the more appreciation you will have for God's grace in the dispensation of grace. You see God's grace even back in the Old Testament, not the dispensation of grace. Um, if you go back to Daniel chapter 7, Now, let me read that one in Colossians 2 again. Blotting now, Colossians 2.14, the handwriting of ordinances that was contrary, that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, having spoiled principalities and power. Daniel 7, verse 25. It says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hands until a time and times and a dividing of times. So even this guy comes along, he, try, he tries changing things. Israel could get, never get it right. You know, they didn't, they didn't know that the law would, couldn't make you perfect. You don't find that out until you, until you come to Paul, that the law can't make you perfect. It's God's grace, and he's been giving that, offering it to people for 2,000 years, and um, some people, they get stuck on their religious highways, and they don't, you know, they don't understand the God's grace, and that they certainly don't understand it's the faith of Christ and not their faith. We have faith in him because of what he did and what he teaches. So, um, so there, there's so much stuff, you know, we're, well, I won't get into that. Just to show you some statistics about the phrase that the, in that day. In and that in day occur in the Bible 1,655 times, 55 times. In 405 verses, including 115 exact phrases. Okay? Now, there is something more written in the Bible, more about Jesus Christ. 
the most, the most, the biggest topic in the Bible is prophetic last times, end times. That's the biggest topic in the Bible, more than sin, more than Jesus Christ, more than Satan. Because you see all these things back there, and you look at this point here in the ages to come, a lot of these things said back here haven't been fulfilled. And we know God isn't a liar. Um, let me see her. You will recall in, in Isaiah chapter 2, the exact phrase in that day is used three times. In that day conveys that the Lord shall arise in judgment. Where is he when he arises? Where's the Lord when he arises? Anybody, not you, Debbie. Okay, but where's that at? Heaven. heaven. Okay, John got it right. The right hand of God, and he's in heaven. Because where does the day of the Lord begin? In heaven, right? Then he does the earth when he comes down here. He is in heaven. First the Lord arises in heaven to cleanse and purge the heavens. Then he will come down to earth to do the same as written in our Bible. This is the most written about topic in the Bible, Barna. It, it just flows over and over. So if you're given a hint of the truth and you want the truth, you can't miss it. Because it's very clear in Paul's epistles that we will not have to go through this tribulation time period. The great and notable day of the Lord. When this day arrives on the earth in prophecy, it can be called the day of Jehovah. We know that Christ Jesus is Jehovah. But in prophecy, it is all about what the Lord is going to do on earth. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You don't find anything about, you see mention of heaven now and then, but there's nothing about heaven when you're, when you're going, I mean, heaven, when you're going through prophecy, it isn't until you come to the Apostle Paul in the dispensation of grace that he takes that realm and puts it into focus and we have the heaven and the earth and the heaven's going to be done first and we will be brought up there and all that kind of stuff. So the Lord, what he's going to do on earth, Paul talks about what he's going to do in the heavens. And that is why Paul would use the whole title of, of, of Jesus Christ because now we know that his coming is not only to restore his authority in the earth, but after he restores the heavens, this is why Paul can give you the fullness of it, the fullness of his title. Now, I want you to go to Acts chapter <clears throat> excuse me, 20. Acts chapter 20. By the way, when I asked Sam what high school he went to, Prospector Arlington, that's back in Illinois, but he went to CLA, which is called Christian Liberty Academy. And they are a millennial. You know what that means? They're bringing the kingdom down here. The kingdom's here, and they're, they're going to bring it about. Yeah, material already. So you've got to act certain ways. And Sam went there all his life when he was in high school. Now, Sam's father was a right division teacher, so he didn't fall for that. But my children went there for a short time. One day, we were going there to pick up Zach, and he was about 20 minutes late. And he, he comes out of the building, and he's crying. And I said, what are you crying for? He says, my Bible teacher's unsaved. <laughs> he was eight or nine years old. I go, what? So guess who talked to the Bible teacher the next day? It didn't go well. So I asked him, I, I, he says, I don't know if I'm saving or not. I said, what are you doing teaching the Bible? Now, when my daughter was in sixth grade, the pastor there got up and preached that Jesus Christ didn't die for all people. That's when we took him out of that CLA, Christian Liberty Academy, and she homeschooled them. Thank God for you. You did that. I could have never done that. But the point is, she homeschooled them. He didn't die for everybody. How does that sit with you? That is total, totally contrary to all 13 of Paul's epistles. Well, seven, 2 Timothy 2.14 talks about that. By my mouth, the, the, the information might be fully known. Colossians 1.25 was given to Paul to fulfill the word of God. But when you go to Acts 
chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Let me start at verse 24. Paul says, he's talking here. Now Luke wrote it, Paul's talking. But none of these things move me, neither count I, I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. The minist ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. That's the only time that's said in the Bible. The gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. There's going to be a heavenly kingdom, right? Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Now, did Peter ever say that, or could he say that? Sam brought it up. Paul rebuked Peter because he was walking two-faced. Did John say that? Did James say that? All the counsel of God. Now we know by this time, the six Acts period epistles have been written. Okay? Paul will get further information when you get out of Acts. Um, this is why we study prophecy. So don't let anybody come up to you and say that we don't study prophecy. It's, it's not true. There is such a contrast between what God's doing today compared to what he did in time past and what he's going to do in the ages to come. And like I said to my wife on the way here, we are very fortunate people. And not only to love each other, I mean, you have skips sometimes, you know, but to be in this dispensation. And, you know, when we caught a hold of this in midlife, I, I couldn't believe it. And, you know, it's, why would I get up 4 o'clock in the morning and take classes like this? You know, well, who does that kind of stuff? You know? And it's, why have I been coming here? Because it, being raised what we were raised, it, it, it took such an effect. And then I talked to somebody yesterday that he said he, he came and witness to this person, and the person went bonkers on him. Didn't want to hear anything. The person was talking about the God and all that, but when he tried just to give a little bit of innovation about Pauline truth, they got angry with him. And they didn't know, well, he, he had to stop speaking because, you know, he's just not, he wasn't doing it offensively. He wasn't knocking their religion or what she knew. But then look at this. Look at that. He's trying to reconcile the world. Paul's the one that fulfilled the word of God. He, you know, he gives the last message. Those Hebrew epistles were written before Paul finished 2 Timothy, probably in, most of them in the book of Acts. So in 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul emphasizes that the day of the Lord is when he comes back to the earth. We, the body of Christ, will be in the heavens when that day arrives. We, the church, the body of Christ, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, the one new man, Ephesians 2, 15, the new creature, 2 Corinthians 5.17, are holding back this prophesied event in the day of the dispensation of grace. We're holding this back. That's why we're in 2 Thessalonians 2, because people were coming to them, making them think that the, the rapture already happened, or they missed it, or it isn't even here. It's not going to come. They were, they were preaching opposite what Paul was trying to teach them. We are not really worried about the Lord's coming to the earth. We go in the rapture. We are gathered together with them, with him. We are then taken into the presence of the Father, and in the presence of the Father, when Revelation 4 and 5 take place, when who is worthy to open the books take place, we are there, we are presented to the Father, and our presence is there already. Revelation 12, 12 is the only verse in Revelation that could possibly be talking about us. So the first thing you have is the day of redemption. Okay? Then you have the judgment seat of Christ, where we're not judged for our sins. That's already taken care of. Then you go to the presentation cer ceremony. Okay? Let me see here. 
Go to 2 Corinthians 11. We are going to be presented to the Father. Second Corinthians eleven and Second Corinthians four fourteen. Second Corinthians eleven says, Let me start at verse one. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now, this is, we're not married to Christ. People want to say that. There's, there's symbolism here. So we have the day of redemption, the judgment seat of Christ, and then the presentation ceremony. Then we go on in eternity. Look at chapter 4, verse 14. Second Corinthians 4, 14 says, Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. There's a presentation ceremony. By the way, Don and Gloria are still at the Cleveland Clinic, and um, so I'm, I'm not sure what's going on there, but they're, you know, they're, she had some retaining water problems, so we'll find out pretty soon. And we're supposed to take down the tables today. I forgot that. I get wrapped up in something. I just. <laughs> she was, Debbie's going to yell at me if I didn't say those things. So I'm deathly afraid of that. <laughs> Somebody's not believing me. Okay. There are two categories of latter times and last days in the Bible prophetic and mystery. Understanding this is critical. And then when he arises to come back and take his possessions and goes into the heavens and dispossesses Satan and his, and his hosts, we are there to be put into those positions that we are destined for. Go to Romans, uh, Revelation chapter 12. Those positions that we are destined for. We see all of this in 1 Thessalonians. Paul says, about 2 Thessalonians 2. And that day these false teachers are telling you all about this stuff in the day of the Lord, but they're not telling you what I am telling you. Remember that day of Christ, 2 Thessalonians 2.2. 2. Every time we see the day of Christ, it's a good thing. And the false teachers were coming in and trying, no, that's, that's going to be the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, you read about it in Isaiah, the day of the Lord, it's, something, it's bad. It's prophecy. It's the prophetic end times, the most written about topic in the Bible. Um, let me see here. Yeah. Um, How many of you have speak, spoken to people that say we are the bride of Christ? Yeah. We're married to him? Everybody. Catholic priests have a, have a ring. They're married to Christ. I was standing taking a shower at the Y one time, and a Catholic priest was in there. He didn't have his things on. He was showering too. And he showed me his ring. He said, I'm married to Christ. I go, <laughs> you know, <laughs> married to Christ. In Revelation chapter 12, Verse 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. We will be dwelling there, right there. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Remember I said about the people think we're the right of Christ? What is this? What's this? Huh? 
Well, I gotta wait till I get to that verse, I think. Hold on a second. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. The Lord uses weep or weeping 16 times in the book. He writes lamentations, which is one long mournful lament about the destruction of Jerusalem historically by Nebuchadnezzar and predominantly by the Lord Jesus Christ. Lamentations 1 verse 12. It is nothing to you all ye that pass by, behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which is done unto me, wherewith the Lord hath afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. Now, every one of Paul's epistles begins with grace and peace, or, you know, at least those two words. There's another word in, in the pastoral epistles, grace and peace. He doesn't say anything about the fierce anger. He doesn't say we're going to burn in fire, like Hebrew says. He doesn't say that. Jeremiah describes the beginning of the captivity under the heel of Nebuchadnezzar. It is the day of his fierce anger. Jeremiah's vision includes, this is on you, the Babylonian captivity, there's seven points, the return after 70 years, the worldwide dispersion, the final regathering, the kingdom age, the day of judgment on the Gentile powers and the remnant of Israel. That's what Jeremiah covers. In Lamentations, the Lord is destroying Israel. The Lord is bringing Nebuchadnezzar in. Let's go there and let's read verses, Lamentations 2, verses 1 to 5. Lamentations 2, verses 1 to 5. Now, again, they're mournful. They're, they're, the, the Lord doesn't like them. He's, being, he's judging them. And all this stuff is written down so much that you almost have to be blind if you don't recognize it. But people don't because they get a certain understanding about the Bible, and, and it's the wrong thing as far as to understand how God's working today. And that point deals with the judgment seat of Christ. What did you do after you got saved? Not about your sin. Um, did you get the tr truth? Do you think you have the truth? Uh, you know, but when we can go to people and mention verses and explain context and they get angry, you know, that's why I say you can get drunk around religion and you can't have a bottle of tequila. You know, it's just, it's, it's crazy. And this one guy I talked to yesterday, he was just pouring out his heart because he was attacked by a person that he knew verbally. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. How hath the Lord covered the daughter of Zion with the cloud of his anger and cast down from heaven unto the earth the beauty of Israel and remember not his footstool in the day of his anger? Look at this, all prophetic things. This doesn't pertain to us. It pertains to Israel. The Lord has swallowed up all the habitations of Jacob, Israel, and if not pitied, he hath thrown down in his wrath the strongholds of the daughter of Judah. He hath brought them to the ground. He hath polluted the kingdom and the princes thereof. He hath cut off in his fierce anger all the horn of Israel. That means strength. Horn. He hath drawn back his right hand from before the enemy, and he burned against Jacob like a flaming fire, which devoureth round about. He hath bent his bow like an enemy, he stood with his right hand as an adversary and slew all them, all that were pleasant to the eye in the tabernacle of the daughter of Zion. He poured out his fury like fire. The Lord was an enemy, was as an enemy. He hath swallowed up Israel. He hath swallowed up all her palaces. He hath destroyed his strongholds and hath increased in the daughter, I mean, and hath increased in the daughter of Judah mourning and lamentation. This isn't something good here. 
This is what Israel is going to get, what they had. They experienced a lot of this in time past, but the fullness of this will come in this time period. So we're fortunate to be in this dispensation, to know this. If you know where you're going to go when you die, aren't you happy about that? I don't, I don't want to say lucky. What's the word I use again? Well, fortunate. You're fortunate. And we don't have any doubt about that because we've settled the final authority issue. We're not the final authority. This is the Bible. On your outline here, Lamentations 2.17. The Lord hath done that which he had devised. He hath fulfilled his word that he had commanded in the days of old. He hath thrown down and hath not pitied. He hath caused thine enemy to rejoice over thee. He hath set up the horn of thine adversaries, their strength. This is Leviticus 26, the five courses of judgment, and Deuteronomy 31, pouring out his wrath on Israel and many other places. Lamentations 2, 21 and 22. The young and the old lie on the ground in the streets. My virgins and my young men are fallen, as in a solemn day my terror is round about, so that in the day of the Lord's anger, none escaped nor remained. Those that I have swaddled and brought up hath my enemies, hath my enemy consumed. This is total destruction. Total, total destruction. I read that point to point out that when the captivity began, they understood it was the wrath and anger of God on Israel. It was the beginning of the day of his wrath. Lamentations 5.16. The crown is fallen from her head. Woe unto us that we have sinned. That's called the diadem. It's a crown of authority, political authority. Israel lost her political crown of authority through her sin, her pride, and her rebellion. Now, I want you to compare the following two verses with the next following two verses. Here's the bad ones. Deuteronomy 28.13. And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. What did the Lord originally make Israel as? The tail or the head? The head. But now she should become the tail. Okay? Revelation 5, verse 10. And has made, has made, unto, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Now, compare this. This is Israel's exalted position, and the scripture says we'll be again. But Deuteronomy 28, 43 to 44. The stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. He shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. Isaiah 9, 14. Therefore, the God will cut off from Israel head and tail, branch and rush in one day. So the Gentiles are ruling due to Israel's apostasy. And their, prophet, their punishment is prophesied all over the Bible. And this, this, today's dispensation, salvation-wise, Israel is no different than the Gentiles. Everybody gets saved the same way. If you go to Ezekiel... Chapter 21, and then Isaiah chapter 62, Ezekiel 21, and Isaiah chapter 62. Now, Ezekiel 21, just get, Israel, Ezekiel was a fifth course prophet. God takes away the kingdom, the crown, the political crown from Israel until he, until he comes whose right it is to receive it. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you want to see that, keep your finger there in both those places. Let me just read you this from Daniel. Daniel chapter 1. 
Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. Verse 2. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with the part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. No. Look at chapter 2 and verse 44. Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. He says, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and, in, and it shall stand forever. So right now we're in the times of the Gentiles. You've got Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, and all these Gentile nations have been ruling throughout the centuries when, when, the, when the time of the Gentiles began. The Lord's not ruling here. He's not on, he's not on the throne. He's up in heaven right now. Let me see. Look at that. Isaiah chapter 62. Let me read you verses 1 to 5. Isaiah 62 verse 1. And you know what? You need to get Revelation chapter 21. Sorry. Don't yell at me. Just yell at my wife. We're in Isaiah chapter 62 and Revelation 21. So you've all heard that we're the bride of Christ or we could be the bride of Christ and this and that, right? We're married to him. We're not. And it's, it's, this is symbolic language. The presentation ceremony, you know, he wants us to be like a virgin. He wants us to be pure, you know, and we're made pure. We're, we're, we still, we, our sins have been taken away, and he wants us to grow in knowledge of his, of his word in, 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 inside the man. And Isaiah 62, it says, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness and all kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem, that's the, the crown, in the hand of thy God. Thou shalt, shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither thy land any more be, more be termed desolate. But thou shalt be called Hephzibah, and the land Beulah. The Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall the sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. Now, this is all symbolic. We are not the bride of Christ. We're not married to him. Go to Revelation 21. You might want to mark Revelation 21. Um, and I say, yeah, mark Revelation 21, verses 1 and 2, and 9 and 10. By that verse in Isaiah 62. So it's Revelation uh, 21, verses 1 and 2, and 9 and 10. And you're going to see, they're going to be brought... Attached back to their land, they're going to be married back to it. Revelation 21, And I saw the new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her, her husband. It's, it's a prepare. We're not his bride. You read in Matthew 6, The kingdom come that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is it's going to be coming out of heaven, down to heaven, and then verse 9 and 10, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. Who is the bride, the Lamb's wife? What does verse 1 and 2 say? Okay, the heavenly Jerusalem. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, 
and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. This is when the whole nation is purged. They're dealing. They've dealt with it. They're all burned up, and they get back, get back with the Lord, and he's going to marry them back to the land. It's going to be a permanent possession. It can't be taken away from them anymore. Now, that, to me, that settles the issue. We're not the bride of Christ. We are saved people. We're saved saints, and we're called saints, but in the dispensation of grace, and the, the language is symbolic in Revelation. It's symbolic in Second Corinthians 11. You know, it doesn't mean we're an actual bride or married to him. We don't have to wear a ring saying that. We're just, we're, well, I don't want to go on. Um, okay. Got that done. Back to your outline, Israel lost her political crown of authority through her sin, pride, and rebellion. Wait, I already did this. The last paragraph. Regarding 2 Timothy 2.2, 2 Thessalonians 2.2. 2. It says that ye be soon not shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Okay. They were confusing the two programs, the, the, the people that came, the Thessalonians. In 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Now we are going to talk about our gathering unto him. I want you in your minds to attach verse 2 to verse 1, not to verse 3. Okay, because it says the day of Christ and all the other times you read that passage, it's something good, something that we want. Our gathering together to be with Christ is more than one single event. Rather, our gathering to be with him is a series of events. Let me read the verse again. Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.2, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit, as by person or by word or, or nor by letter it's from us, as that day of Christ should be at hand. The Thessalonians were being attacked on the timing of the rapture. As previously mentioned, they were confusing the two programs, the prophetic program with Israel and the mystery program with the body of Christ. Both of them have not only an association with Christ's first coming, but also with his return. Israel has a gathering, we have a gathering. They are not the same. So we're going to focus on ours. Recall in 2 Thessalonians last week that some people were troubling them and shaking them in mind. We learned that the day of our Lord Jesus Christ was a good thing for us. Because every time you see the day of Christ in Paul's epistles, it was a good event except in 2 Thessalonians 2.2. But the day of the Lord is a bad thing for Israel. Now, you've got to differentiate the day of Christ or the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, Isaiah chapter 2, it's, it's talking about prophecy for the nation of Israel, judgment. The attack on, on Paul's truth of the doctrine of the rapture was attacked in the earliest days. But now you get this expanded understanding of Christ's name and title. Paul gives the final installment of progressive revelation to add to the completion of what God is doing. Now, just for the heck of it, I want you to see these verses. Let's, I want you to read them with me. When the first one is Ephesians 1.10. What God, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. Remember, progressive revelation. Ephesians 1.10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, even in him. There's the two programs right there. We're going to be the heavenly people. We're going to be the ones in Revelation 12, 12 that's shouting for joy because Satan's going to be kicked out midweek. Look at um, 
chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Okay? That shows two realms right there. It goes back to Genesis 1, 1, and it proves the fact from Genesis 1, 2 and on, it's only talking about the earth, not about the heavenly place. Philippians chapter 2, verse 10. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth. Now, how many of the Old Testament prophets said anything like this? None. Go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 20. Colossians 1, 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him talking about Jesus Christ. Now, this is the expanded knowledge that, that Paul gets. Verse 20, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all, th all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So how many times do you need that said in the Bible before you're going to believe that? And I'm not trying to be nasty. Paul gives understanding to the prophetic program as well as a new program that has been kept secret. Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.3 Let no man deceive you by any means, any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That day, the day that they, false teachers, are telling them is at hand. But that day should not come, except certain events take place. 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he's God. That day they are talking about, and prophecy, is called the day of the Lord. The difficulty with this is that most people misidentify the day of Christ in 2 Thessalonians 2.2, 2, just as these false teachers have done. Paul knows, Paul knows that the day of the, what the day of the Lord is. He taught them about it in 1 Thessalonians 5. He says, you're, not gonna, you're, you're the part, people of the day, not of the night. That's part of the night. That's part of the prophecy. They're prophesying back here. It's going to be finished up here. It's going to be nighttime. It's going to be bad for them. Paul, not, Paul is writing to them about what the false teachers were saying. They were trying to make it scary and troubling. Remember, attach verse 2 to verse 1. Every other place, it is a cause of rejoicing. The day of Christ, the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, the day of Jesus Christ. How did this come about? Who did this? The false teachers are the ones who want to trouble them. And here in this text, made it bad news. This is not Paul's teaching. They are contradicting Paul's teaching, and that made it bad news. The false teachers did not understand the context. That day is obviously a reference to the day of the Lord. Look at the events that follow that verse. There are the events of the 70th week of Daniel. The day of the Lord is involved in that. This is prophecy. Notice again. The issue is going to focus on timing. The idea of, of coming is not that it comes into existence, but that it is going to come down to the earth. The term the day of the Lord was coined by Isaiah originally. The term that day that Paul is using in the text was coined by Moses. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 31, and let's read verses 17 and 18. Deuteronomy 31. 17 and 18. Deuteronomy 31, 17 and 18. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them, 
I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them. So that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? He's not showing his face anymore. Israel's in the context here, folks. And I will surely hide my face in that day for all the evils which they shall have wrought. And that day are turned under, under God, under other gods. So this is about Israel. And the most written about topic in the Bible, prophetic end times, the latter times, the end times over here. That day and the day of the Lord describe the captivity of the nation of Israel. Those are two terms used in prophetic scripture to describe the fifth course of chastisement or judgment, Leviticus 26, that the nation of Israel is going to find itself under when they get to that point. Now, they were at that point, but God reached down and saved Saul, a type of the Antichrist, and ushered in the dispensation of grace. It began with the Babylonian captivity around 600 B.C., extends all the way into the earthly kingdom. The day of the Lord began back in the time of Israel's captivity. We also learned that a day has more than one part to it, daytime and nighttime. So when you think about the day of the Lord, it is not necessarily a 24-hour day. It is going to be a period of time, but also it is going to have more than one part to it. There is also what is called the great and notable day of the Lord, or the great and terrible day of the Lord. That is the intensified point in which the Lord personally pours out his wrath. His cup is filled with indignation. We saw this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. When he comes in flaming fire and power and great glory in that notable day when the crescendo of his wrath reaches its zenith. It begins with Nebuchadnezzar back in, in Ezekiel. Let me go to... Go back to Ezekiel chapter 30. Ezekiel chapter 30. And let me read you verses 1 to 3 and then 10, 12, and 24. Ezekiel 30, verses 1 to 3. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Howl ye, woe, worthy is the day. For the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near, a cloudy day, it shall be the time of the heathen. It's the same thing as the time of the Gentiles. Look at verse 10. Thus saith the Lord God, I will also make the multitude of Egypt to cease by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He uses his enemies that hate Israel to conquer them. Look at verse 12. And I will make the rivers dry and sell the land under the hand of the wicked, and I will make the land waste, and all that is, is therein by the, by the hand of the stranger. I, the Lord, have spoken it. They lost that died in the political crown of authority. Verse 24. And I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon and put my sword in his hands, but I will break Pharaoh's arms and he shall groan before him with the groanings of a deadly wounded man. So he initially gives him the power to do this, but then he's going he's to get killed. He's going to die. The whole point of me teaching these things is to show you what's happening back here, is to uh, educate you more about what's going on back here so that your appreciation for grace and dispensation of grace grows. And I know you appreciate it greatly. But knowing some of these things brings it all into focus, and you can see the, 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 that the, most, the biggest thing written about in the Bible is this, the, the prophetic end times, letter times. Notice in verse 3 are two very important phrases. One is the time of the heathen. The term heathen is used interchangeably with the Gentiles and nations. The other term is the day of the Lord. Ezekiel 30, 30, 30, verse 3. For the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near. Verse 10. 
You see, God says, I will do this, this, and this, but I'm going to use Nebuchadnezzar as my instrument to execute my judgments. Okay. Go to Isaiah chapter 10. You've heard of the Assyrian, right? Assyrian is another name for Antichrist. Assyria is the land. Isaiah chapter 10. Let me start at verse 5. O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger, and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. This is what he's given Nebuchadnezzar. I will send him against an hypocritical nation, that's Israel, and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Some have said to me, read these verses from Paul that show you we are in the end times, the prophetic end times, they mean. So you either miss the rapture or the rapture is not true. I've had this said to me. But let's read these passages and see what they really say. Go to 2 Timothy, chapter 3. And let me read you. Chapter 2, I'm sorry. Now this is, you know what 215 is? Chapter 3? Oh yeah, chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. This know also that in the last days, Perilous times shall come. Now, this is the last days of the dispensation of grace. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, breakers false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, religion, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins and led away with divers lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Boy, is that true. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do, do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. So they use this passage with me, say we're in the end times. But I would say these characteristics have been true of mankind since the beginning, since Adam fell. Right? Every word I said down here is true of all mankind in, in history. These are not some signs. These, these, are, these, these things, all the things I, I read here is internal, not physical. The Jew requires the sign. They're internal. When haven't these characteristics been true of mankind? Now, 2 Timothy 2, verses 16 and 17. It shows you how to write, how to study, verse 15. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto the more ungodliness, and their word will eat, eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. They're also saying the rapture passed you or it's not going to come. So this, you know, the button it up, for the Jews require a sign, but these are not the signs God has prophesied that nation that Israel will experience in their end times. Just read the book of Revelation. The characteristics laid out in 2 Timothy define unsaved mankind throughout history and in both programs. And you have to know the difference. Dear Lord, thank you for this time and your word. And please allow it to work grace in ourselves 
fully when we leave here. Amen. Thank you. Amazing Grace, we're going to sing the first and the last verses.